going to be uh, So, I'm going to tell you about uh, yeah. how to sneak synthetic molecules into cells, okay? And it's a big challenge, all right? And people in, in science, the biologists look at it a different way, the chemists look at it a different way, the delivery guys would look at it a different way. I'm coming from a chemistry background, therefore I'm going to give you the chemistry um, perspective of how to sneak a synthetic molecule into cell, okay? And it's very important. So uh, when you have a cell here in the middle, obviously the, the size here is not representative, okay? So a small molecule is really small, the cell is really big. But if you have a cell in the middle, there's a lot of interest of how to get a small molecule, something that we synthesize in the lab, or it's actually uh, extracted from natural resources, or how you get an RNA or DNA into the cell, how you get a protein into the cell, or even smaller than a protein, how do you get a peptide inside the cell, okay? And this is very interesting because all of these, you try to use them to manipulate the signal inside the cell. Maybe, or most commonly used for therapeutics, okay? So people like the medicines that you take, there are small molecules and they get inside the cell. Uh, now it's becoming a big challenge because there's a lot of interest in RNA therapeutics, in proteins as, 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 as drug molecules, and in peptide therapeutics. But the challenge is if how to get these inside the cell because the cell is very selective. It doesn't tell anything to go in. So in conclusion, in terms of when you're looking at what gets inside the cell, you need to consider the size, you need to consider the charge, the charge nature of the molecules. You can consider the 3D shape. That's quite important. And there is a property of the molecules that we call lipophilicity. It's how lipid-like it is, okay? Because the membrane is lipid. If it is lipid, it's more likely it goes, comes across it. So... This is the general concept. What my interest is in a class of molecules they call nucleosides or nucleotides. Nucleosides and nucleotides, they're actually the building blocks of DNA or RNA. Any DNA or RNA is either made of what we call dioxynucleosides, this, these ones, or ribonucleosides, these ones in the bottom. The main difference between these two is this OH that you could see here. It makes a huge difference, okay? It's a simple change, but it makes a huge difference. So my interest is in these kind of molecules. Why I'm interested in this? Because if you take a natural nucleoside and make a small modification to the structure, you get a drug molecule, okay? If you take this dioxycytidine, it's in the DNA of every living organism. If you get rid of this OH, you get rid of it there, that gives you an anti-HIV compound. That's used for the treatment for HIV. If you take uh, dioxyguanosine, you delete, you take scissors, and you cut the bottom half of it, it gives you a cyclovir. If you cross the road to Sainsbury's, you will see them selling a cyclovir for cortisol, okay? And if you take, for example, dioxythymidine, which is in DNA, and again, you replace this OH with an N3, an azide group, it gives you zovidine, okay? Which is used for treatment of HRV. So they, this is my interest. They're very nice molecules. They're from nature, but if you modify them slightly, they give you a drug molecule, okay? And the modification is not necessarily they take place in the bottom part, which is the sugar, this part, or the nucleobase, you might have the modifications in both. And very often they give you very good drug molecules. They, they have one big problem. When you take a natural nucleoside or natural, natural molecule and you modify it, it actually inside the cell, it doesn't become as good as the natural one. Because if you take the unnatural one and put it inside the cell, it needs to be activated inside the cell. So we call it transformation. So the first transformation, second and third transformation. It is after transformation to the third one, what we call the triphosphate, when it becomes active. So by itself, when you make it in the lab, it's not really active. When you put it inside the cell, it gets converted all the way over there. So the nucleoside analog therapeutics that are on the market, they are not very, uh, very well phosphorylated to go from the first stage to the second stage. In fact, out of all the steps, the first step is the most difficult. And it makes common sense because the enzyme is used for the natural substrate and suddenly you give it something that's unnatural, it might phosphorylate it, but the efficiency would be low. So you say then, why don't we leave this and we try to put on the cell this, this, and this. These are not very good drug molecules, okay? They are unstable, they get cleaved to go back to the original one, to the main one, okay? And they have issues because of the charge, they actually get, they, the cellular uptake is quite poor. So what can we do? If we have something in the lab or in cells, we know it's actually quite good, how can we make it into a drug molecule, something that the patient could benefit from? So here come the concept. So if you take the nucleoside and the first step to attach this, the phosphate, you know it's the most difficult, 
If you put this on the cell, it doesn't get inside the cell because of the negative charges. So the most obvious thing is what you do, you block those negative charges with whatever. But these groups that use them to block it, when they get, once they get inside the cell, what needs to happen to them, they need to come off to deliver to you what you failed to deliver from the first step. Okay? So you have something that blocks the charges, gets inside the cell, whatever blocks the charges comes off, and then once you deliver the monophosphate, then it gets activated inside the cell to give you the therapeutic effect at the end. Okay? And uh, someone I worked for before, he developed what we call, what is known now as a phosphoramidate. Okay? So this red and this green, he worked for around 20 years to develop this red and this green. The red one should be this part, the green one should be that part. Okay? 20 years. Very smart guy. Here he is, at Cardiff University. So basically is an aromatic ring, and here you've got an amino acid and an ester. Okay? 20 years to optimize it to where it is now. The question is, does it work? The question is before that, does it actually inside the cell, when it gets inside the cell, would it actually give you this inside the cell? And we've shown it for, uh, in a number of ways that it's actually yes. If you take what we call the phosphoramidase, the block with the charges, it will actually give you what you want at the end, the monophosphate, using enzymes to cleave it. The concept is there. It's very, it's very, very, it's, it's shown. But the problem is, does it mean if you take something and block it in this way, and it gets inside the cell, it will give you the therapeutic effect that you could see. Will it make it better? Would this make it better than the nucleoside without the blocking? Okay? And the data are supportive of that. If you take this, this for example, an anti-cancer compound called gemcitabine. If you take gemcitabine against prostate cancer or colon cancer, if you take the gemcitabine by itself, you will see a better improvement of 106 fold, for example, in uh, colon cancer. 14-fold in the prostate cancer. I will pass through this quickly. This is the most impressive. This is an HRV compound, okay? There is the, a back of it, for example, if you take the nucleoside itself, and then you make the phosphate and block it, there's an improvement of 9,000 times of potency, okay? So you take something that is very poor to turn it into something that's really good. And we've shown it for uh, cancer, for HIV, HIV again, that's another HIV compound. That's the most impressive. And the big story came from hepatitis C, okay? Hepatitis C, for example, if you take this one, is completely inactive. The activity here is 1.3, yeah? AZC, AZU, sorry. It's an overhanded micromolar. It has no effect whatsoever. If you put this motif to it, it allows it to get inside the cell. It allows it to be active inside the cell. You get it from something that's completely inactive into something that has 3.1 uh, micromolar activity. So what are we now? Have this kind of motifs actually delivered dog molecules? All of this is just in the lab. The answer is yes. So this compound here uh, was made at Cardiff University 2008. Was, uh, it was very active against HIV. There was a small company called Pharmavit took it, and then Inhibitex, then bristol myers Squibb For one compound made in the lab, I was there when the compound was made. This was sold for $2.65 billion, just the simple compound that you could see. A competitor who's using the same technology, as you could see, we, we said aromatic amino acid ester, that's aromatic amino acid ester on their different compound, okay? They took it against for hepatitis C, very active. They were probably, they have uh, probably uh, better negotiators in the deal than what Cardiff had because they sold this for 11 billion pounds, okay? And it became the first nucleoside analog phosphoramidate that's, that's actually approved. So now patients could use that particular compound for treatment. And it's actually, uh, the forecast for it is going to be the most, the biggest selling drug on the market over the next few years because there's a big need for it. But the technology is there. This is what we call developing platform technology that you could apply to different things. So the technology could apply to hepatitis C, HIV. In this case, for example, the same technology is being applied, for example, to anti-cancer, this compound, okay, with a company called the New Kana Biomed. So the technology is there. The question is, what else could we do with it? We know we could take small molecules, get them inside the cell. Very nice, very nice drug molecules. So now the question, the, the answer is, what I'm going to tell you is that I'm working on trying to apply that technology to RNA proteins and peptides. And we go and acquire, we, we actually got some uh, very interesting data that we could actually apply it into all of those class of molecules. I'm going to finish here because otherwise Osama will just tell me off. So I am done. <laughs> Any questions, I'm free to take them. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Any questions for you? Yes. Thank you very much. Very insightful. And, Thank you. And very nice talk. Actually, it, 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 the, the question that I wanted to ask is, how about RNA? Because we know that uh, you know it's a big, big uh, buzz today to uh, gene therapy. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work perfectly yet. So this can be an alternative, actually, to uh, gene therapy, introducing, for example, interferon RNA, dsRNA, and knockdown cells in vivo. Let me tell you, most of the work, all the work that been done so far, delivering phosphates has focused in small molecules. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I came from the lab when it came out, and that's what I'm doing right now in RNA. But I cannot tell you anymore, okay? Uh -huh. But the technology could be applied to any phosphorylated molecule that you want to get inside the cell. But there is very interesting data about RNA with this technology. Yeah, because you so, can make uh, it more for stable sure. and for uh, sure. uh, with a longer life if it is... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Two more questions. One at the back, and then one over here. So that was a very good question. A few years ago, people were saying when, when this gets inside the cell and the aromatic region comes off, it's quite toxic. Because if you take phenol by itself, put in the cell, is toxic. Okay? But it turns out from the data in animals and even in humans, now it's approved. Yeah? It's quite safe. They're quite safe, uh, safe molecules. Yeah? In fact, uh, down the road from here in Hammersmith, they actually tried in the hospital the last compound that I showed you in the last slide. Sorry, Osama. This one, okay? And the safety profiles are fantastic. They're really good, as well as the activity. So both, they are very good. Yeah. This might be quite a stupid question. I'm not a biochemist, but having learned a little bit about diabetes, what I believe we're talking yes. about, can we use the same concept to try and um, make a glucose go inside the cell and therefore prevent, by, you know, the buildup of glucose in the blood and reduce diabetes, solve this problem? Is that? Can we use this kind of this technology? Kind of no, so I had diabetes is that the cells can't accept glucose, and therefore. No, this kind of technology is a drug delivery technology. So if you, it's if you, delivery. so no, no, if you say to me something, I have something that has a phosphate group, negative charge, it doesn't get inside the cell. I will say to you, this is what I prescribe for you. Okay? If you say to me, we have a phosphatase, we want to inhibit the phosphatase, I will say to you, no, you, this technology is not for you. You need to go and discover something else. Well, it, 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 glucose is basically a natural molecule and it gets into the cell through a receptor. It, right. It's not a passive, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, transport, uh, transport. It needs receptor. So what uh, Yusuf is trying to do is talking about the passive introduction of yeah. an exogenous molecule into the cell. And that's in, in itself challenging yeah. for any drug. Yeah. They make it easier to work with. Okay, let's ask one more question. Yes. Uh, do these molecules have potentially uh, indications for multiple sort of viral conditions? Like you'd be targeting Hep C and HIV and you know, herpes simplex. By the same molecule? Or there would be a... No, you, you can't do that by the same molecule because before you apply the technology, you need to actually profile your molecule. So if you say to me, I have, uh, I have this compound, it's very good against HIV, then you apply, but it doesn't get inside the cell. You, apply, you use this to get inside the cell. The good thing about this, it seems, when you apply the technology, it actually alters the profile. So we've actually taken some compounds that are known against, known to be active against viruses. Yeah, and when you put them, apply the technology and put inside the cell, it becomes an anti-cancer compound. Okay, and it seems to the technology is actually overcoming some resistance mechanism that you could see it in other cell lines. So it, it might change the application of some of the molecules. Yes. Yeah. One more question. I have a stupid question. When you look at the chemical formula for your molecule, yeah. can you guess what is going to be good at? Or is it only after trial and error that you know what is good for and it's not good for? Okay. Yeah, uh, if I ha if I was very confident I would say yes, but I'm not going to say yes. But we could tell you if you see a molecule like this, you will know it has something to do with DNA or RNA because the origin of these kind of molecules, the, the natural analogs, they're from DNA and RNA, so actually naturally existing in the cell. And we modify them a little bit. So if, as soon as they see, forget the part that we added to it, if you take the red part, I would say to you, this has to, to do something to DNA synthesis or, or RNA synthesis, okay? Either for the HIV, for example, they, they, they don't have this OH. Therefore, when they come inside the, the DNA, they stop the elongation of the DNA, it will stop, and the cells will die, okay? For antiviral, they work by different mechanisms, okay? 
So in here, they will be inhibiting some enzymes that are actually important for the viral replications, for example, for viruses, yeah. Um, uh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've mentioned... Could you speak up just a bit? Yeah, um, you've mentioned the application of cancer treatment and you've given an example of gemfantopine, and that takes me back to my first question about the safety profile. Yeah. Um, you quite rightly mentioned that this is a passive uptake in sure. cells. Sure, yeah. Um, which, when you use it in cancer, it means it's many different cells are going to take the drug, so you're going to be targeting inevitably yeah. some other drug yeah, yeah, yeah. side effects. So yeah, yeah. Cancer at the moment seems to be going towards more targeted therapies. Yeah. Is there a new scope for that technology being used in that way? Of course, because if you look, if you look, the problem, the, the thing is, you could change what the blue is and what the pink is and what the red is. Basically, you tune it. You do fine tuning of the molecules. And you could get them selective <laughs> against one cancer cell line more than healthy cell or cancer cells. This is the same compound is more selective, for example, against, uh, you say, prostate than for colon cancer. OK? And you will do the same. So you, you, do, you do not go and take this and, and stick it to anywhere. You actually need to play with this and this modify them. And the way you modify it, you actually could tune it towards a particular cancer that you want. Gemcitabine, being the last one I showed you here, it's very exciting. So this particular compound, when they entered clinical trials, they had in mind a certain type of cancer. But then they found that it's more active against another type of cancer. So they switched the whole clinical trials towards what they're doing now. So you could actually play with it to tune it against selectivity towards the specificity towards certain types of cancers than others.